Oh, I like the waves. That's, that's new, actually. That's very new. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to my session today. I am going to be talking about scaling non-traditional contributor mentoring initiatives for Kubernetes. Um, I have been working on this for roughly five months. This is a sub-project of the Contributor Experience Special Interest Group. Um, these initiatives are targeted towards both new and current contributors. I just want to tell folks that because for some reason there is a stigma with mentoring that uh, this means only new folks, uh, but we are really trying to also pull together programs and initiatives for owner's files, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but first, my clicker doesn't work again. Dang it. Hold on one second. And now it does. All right. So first things first, the, uh, the part that I always have to do that I uh, detest the most, which is the about me slide. Um, I, again, am Paris Pittman. I work at Google. Um, I've been with uh, Kubernetes as well as Google for uh, roughly eight months at this point. It feels like three days sometimes. Uh, sometimes it also feels like 30 years. So uh, today it's roughly three days. Um, I have been working with technical communities for quite some time. I lived in Baltimore most of my life. I recently moved to San Francisco. I, at one point in Baltimore, I had roughly 10 meetups that I organized, and I thought I lived off of pizza for a good portion of my life. Um, and I, right now, at this point in time, only run one meetup. However, it is the largest Kubernetes meetup in the world. Uh, we have uh, roughly, I think, 4,000 members at this point and see at least 120 people a month. So uh, it's definitely a big, big audience. Um, also, my contact information will be on the last slide, so don't feel the need to uh, write that down right now. So today we're going to talk about uh, quite a few things. I could probably talk about mentoring for eight hours. Uh, this was reduced to 30 minutes, however. Um, so there are large chunks of the uh, organization and the planning process that unfortunately I'm not going to be able to get to today. Uh, and I'm going to kind of speed through some of it. So uh, after the talk, please feel free to meet me out in the hallway and ask me uh, more in-depth questions about the whys and the hows of what I'm working on. Um, but the first thing that we're going to go through is the actual why, uh, and then we'll continue on. So uh, when I was uh, first hired with Google uh, under Sarah Novotny, who built this awesome community of folks, uh, she told me that we really need mentoring. Um, what exactly that meant was up to me to decide and also to do discovery with. Um, so I used several different uh, discovery methods, and I've really been tackling this as an engineering problem and not a people problem. Uh, I feel like uh, a lot of uh, other open source projects as well as organizations and, uh, and corporations treat uh, mentoring as a people problem. Um, and you'll see how uh, we've been tackling this as engineering uh, by creating automation and things like that. Um, but first things first, Aaron kind of doesn't like me for using this graph because he pieced this together uh, through various different data points. Um, but this is actually a really great graph to show because what this is showing you right now is that uh, we are uh, sort of stagnant with unique reviewers and unique uh, approvers throughout owner's files, which uh, to me indicated that uh, this could be an issue for the project go forward. This is not an issue necessarily now, uh, meaning owner's files growth. And for, for folks who don't know what owner's files are, that's really how uh, we uh, how we as a project um, claim ownership of certain things and uh, certain individuals, like uh, approvers and reviewers, uh, get into those owner files so that they can review and approve PRs uh, and work within the GitHub organization. Um, and so not only did we do uh, a lot of dev stats, which we just saw earlier in the session uh, earlier, but uh, we did other data sources. Uh, we did surveying. Uh, I did interviewing. 
uh, and these are the kind of the data points that we, we came across with. Um, one of the surveys that I actually collected, it was 120 contributors of uh, multiple uh, organizations and backgrounds. 60% of those individuals said that they could benefit from a mentor. Uh, I thought that was very significant. Um, and really, after talking with I think it was like 75 one-on-one -on -one interviews that I had uh, and several different focus groups. Um, I realized that most of the issues that folks were having were broken down into a couple different categories. Uh, and those categories were things like they genuinely wanted a mentor, uh, fine. Um, but then also as I asked them questions about like, oh, what would you ask a mentor? Uh, and tell me why you think you need a mentor and things like that. I actually got down to the fact that we just need better contributor documentation. Uh, and that's an undergoing project. Uh, it's actually ongoing probably forever with the life of the project because documentation will continue forever. Um, but this is a problem that I think mentoring should technically solve because if we have better documentation, uh, then possibly these numbers of 60% uh, would be reduced because people uh, were thinking that they need mentoring uh, because um, just because it was, uh, you know, they couldn't necessarily find what they needed to uh, be a valuable contributor. Uh, and I actually heard that valuable contributor quite a lot. Uh, and so I really got down into like what it meant to be a valuable contributor. Uh, and then the owner's files piece, which I just touched on a little bit. Uh, so we need more structure around moving around. Uh, right now we have a community membership markdown file in the, uh, in the community repo. And this is a guide for us on how people get into owner's files and become members of the organization. And um, that kind of provides a guideline to, uh, to how folks kind of move around within the organization. So those were kind of the problems that I thought we needed to solve uh, and tackle. So when I approached mentoring, I was really thinking about these things in mind. So why not traditional mentoring? Um, this seems to be a approach that um, many organizations take. Uh, when, I, when I initially did the CFP, I know some of my coworkers asked, well, what do you mean by traditional mentoring? Like, what's the difference between traditional mentoring and non-traditional mentoring? And really, what we're talking about here is traditional is a one-on-one -on -one with someone that's, that's typically more senior in hopes that um, in hopes that you pair for some kind of extended period of time uh, in like corporations and organizations, it's usually some kind of like director or above. In open source land, it's usually some kind of uh, ma maintainer or high level approver uh, that would take someone under their wing. Uh, there's some kind of goal setting involved. Um, and you know, when we look at that kind of a situation, we really realize that there's a huge time burden in there uh, and that either the mentee or the mentor usually has some kind of uh, burden that's heavier than the other in that relationship. Um, and that kind of sounds good though, right? Um, sure, it does, of course, but there's way more avenues to take uh, than just traditional mentoring. And I'm actually gonna go through why not this. And one main reason why not this is because maintainers aren't necessarily the only mentors. And your peers are, uh, people that are reviewing are, uh, other people in the project can be. Uh, there's always a new way of solving this problem. Uh, but a lot of organizations and open source projects go towards traditional mentoring because it's the easiest to set up. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to think about other ways of solving this problem. Um, but again, that's what I have been trying to get away from uh, because I think there are other ways to solve this problem. So one of the other reasons why traditional mentoring doesn't work is just scale. Now, think about this from just a numbers perspective. So go back to the traditional mentoring example where I gave where I was sure you have this one-on-one -on -one situation. 
if we needed to scale the project and say we needed 50 new contributors, I'm just giving an arbitrary number, uh, we needed 50 new contributors, that means we would need 50 mentors. That's a lot of time uh, and uh, burdens that would be on, uh, on our resources. And um, that doesn't sound that great. Um, also, in these relationships where we're forcing people to get into them, uh, that could create toxicity. Uh, I know when I practiced this with some coworkers, they kind of went, oh, toxicity, mentoring. And if you Google just mentoring and toxicity, you'll see so many, so many, even just research documentation about how uh, these forced relationships uh, or even not forced relationships, but these mentoring relationships become, can become toxic for a number of reasons. Uh, for instance, uh, one that you hear a lot is that the mentor no longer has time for the mentee. Uh, and this can be uh, kind of upsetting to a mentee, depending on what their situation is, because they could be relying on this person for information or relying on this person to push through. Um, so uh, they could think that something's wrong with them. Um, also, there's harassment. There's no way for uh, other people to kind of monitor what's going on in the relationship. Uh, you never know what kind of information they're getting or giving. Um, so there's a number of different things that could really create toxic relationships here. So this is something that we also kept in mind as we build. Um, goal setting's hard. It's another reason why we uh, chose not to necessarily go the traditional route. This is sort of a hot take too, so hopefully you're not live tweeting this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I really believe that if you take goal setting out of a lot of mentoring relationships and you predetermine their goals ahead of time, uh, which you'll see in a second as uh, what I'm talking about, then um, you're really reducing a lot of the burden that's being put on either the mentee or the mentor. I mean, let's face it, you're, say you're a mentee, you're going into this new relationship with someone or this new project. For instance, let's take Kubernetes, you wanna be a new contributor and, um, and uh, you're, it's just kind of daunting. Like the project is so large, it's daunting, you don't know what a SIG is, you have no idea. And then a mentor comes to you in this kind of matching relationship and says, oh, hey, what are your goals? You have no idea what your goals are. Your goals are, I want to make a PR. And then usually they're like, oh, well, what do you want to do in five years? Like, you know, it's kind of like a job interview. Like, I have, I have no idea what I want to do. I just want some information. I want someone to talk to me. Um, I mean, the typical, there's a, like a typical goal setting process. And frankly, we as humans kind of aren't great at goals. Um, so definitely took that in mind uh, as we were building. And then so why else time? Um, I mentioned this previously. Uh, this seems to be the number one reason as to why people don't automatically sign up to mentor. And it's the number one reason why we don't have a line out the door right now. Uh, it's because we do have other time commitments in our life. Uh, and open source, for the most part, is voluntary. Uh, even if you are working on the project full time with a corporation who is donating your, your time to it, uh, you still have things to do and uh, sometimes that traditional one-on-one -on -one mentoring approach where you're constantly having to check in or constantly having to uh, take requests from folks, uh, that can get challenging with the time. So, but why is that though? Why, why do people think that time is such an issue with mentoring? Um, Harvard Business Review actually did a really cool article on this called Demystifying Mentoring. Because frankly, I guarantee you all of you in this room are probably mentors. Um, I know I am and I don't necessarily like to say that because it's like this like weird like, oh wow, I'm a mentor. Uh, but people come to me a lot for advice, uh, whether that's about their, uh, their contributor ladder growth, whether it's about how do I do something, whether it's how do I find a SIG. Uh, and I'm sure people come to you all of the time and ask you those questions, and then I'm sure you answered them, and then maybe they ask you another one. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're naturally just building this trust up with this individual and this relationship. Um, so I think we really need to unpack the term mentor uh, and really educate folks on what the term mentoring means, especially for Kubernetes. Oh, excuse me. Um, and 
Those terms mean, uh, the term mentor means a much different thing to us here. So it really means sponsor. Uh, what's a sponsor? That's somebody with uh, social clout. In order to gain membership into the Kubernetes organization on GitHub, you actually have to have two sponsors. Uh, these are people that have either maybe approved past PRs for you, uh, people in your special interest group, uh, et cetera, but they're just people that are giving you this gateway of trust within the organization. Um, there's also connectors, uh, coaches, guides. You'll note that I have not used necessarily the words teacher uh, because again, teacher also implies that you're providing a lot of your time uh, and a lot of these activities uh, that you'll see don't necessarily need a lot of time. Um, and you'll see by the use cases that the time is not necessarily needed either. So in this discovery period uh, and acting like an engineering problem, I put together a couple of use cases. Again, I, I interviewed about 75 folks, did a couple focus groups, surveyed over 120 people. Um, so we have some significant data on this and the, they fell into a couple different buckets, these folks that were asking for mentors or mentees. Um, the first one is, um, I have some quick questions and I'm not finding it in the docs. Like that's what the, the, you know, the boiled down issue was. Um, the next is uh, I would like to progress further with my contribution. So say they're a current member and they would like to become a reviewer in, a, in an owner's file or they're a current reviewer and they'd like to become a approver. Uh, and for whatever reason, that's just not necessarily happy, na happening naturally. Uh, and they just need some help and some guidance there. Uh, and then of course, I would I just want a one-on-one -on -one session with someone. Yes, I just want to talk to someone really quick, uh, whether that's for an extended period of time or whether that's, um, you know, just a, uh, just a really quick one-on-one -on -one session, uh, like a pair programming, or excuse me, pair programming, a code base tour. I hear that a lot. I hear, I just need a code base tour. Uh, uh, or I just need better documentation on the on the code base uh, and how, uh, how like what the tree looks like, etc. Uh, and then I'm a SIG or I'm in a SIG, uh, I'm a SIG lead, etc. And I need a certain kind of contributor. Uh, so for instance, uh, in the last DevStats session, we saw some things about approvers and how certain SIGs uh, were gaining with issues in PRs, yet their approvers were either staying the same or even decreasing in some cases. Uh, in that case, then uh, how are we attacking the issue of not having a certain kind of contributor and how can we uh, rely on mentoring to, to help out with that? Uh, and the last is I've heard from a lot of members of the community, especially veterans, that we don't have enough students uh, and that, of course, we don't have enough underrepresented folks in tech. Uh, and frankly, any mentoring program that you set up that is not, uh, that does not have underrepresented folks as a priority is no mentoring program to begin with. Uh, so this is a high priority for us and should definitely be included in anything that we do. So, how are we scaling some of these uh, ideas that we have that I'll get into it in a second? And how are we scaling the, the use cases and, uh, and the data that we know? Um, this is a mantra that I've lived by, actually. Uh, when I saw this, I was like, oh wow, cupcakes, ATM, yes. Um, Humans don't scale, systems do. So I really approach, and again, I'm approaching this problem as sort of an engineering issue and um, trying to think of ways that we could turn mentoring into systems. Uh, and you'll actually see that uh, a lot of folks uh, have created, uh, even on GitHub, mentoring systems uh, where people do like one-on-one -on -one matching with uh, automation and algorithms and things like that. So there's ways to beat this, uh, meaning beat this problem. Uh, and I guess if you are building a mentoring program for something that's not Kubernetes and you're in the audience, I think I would definitely approach it as what systems can I use to benefit this? Uh, what, how can I take humans out of this equation? I mean, obviously you have the human mentor and you, the, the human mentee, but how can you scale this uh, in a way? Because a lot of mentoring programs that I've seen fail because there's too many humans in the process and uh, there's too many moving parts. And frankly, as you know, just scheduling calendar invites between multiple parties is very difficult. Uh, we're all very busy folks. So like, how do we take ourselves out of this equation? Um, 
and we're gonna do it by the following ways. So first things first, self-service. Uh, how can a SIG spin up a, uh, a program for mentoring to address their current need for contributors? Um, automation. How can we use the tools that we have as technologists to help us with this problem? Uh, there's things like AppScript and um, IFTT and Airtable and all these ways that we can do it. Uh, but for some reason, we're still living and dying by these like matching spreadsheets and things like that. So there's actually really creative ways that I've looked into uh, where we could really kickstart some cool things through automation. Um, and better documentation. Uh, this alleviates that initial need for people just to go, oh, I need a mentor. Um, and I hear this a lot, uh, especially from new contributors, where they just come on, again, they just come onto the project and they immediately say, oh, I need a mentor. Um, and I can't find the documentation that I need. So better documentation is something that we are actually using to scale. Um, Predefined goals. I touched base on this before, uh, and if we create mentoring programs, then we should ultimately be creating the goals that are baked into that. And I'll show you how we're baking in goals into some of these different programs in a second. Um, and then semi-structured engagements. Uh, what I mean by this is, um, we're all humans and ultimately, again, have busy schedules and uh, therefore in these volunteering assignments, especially mentoring, uh, people tend to either give up easy because there's no accountability or they get busy or what have you. How can we structure this in a way where we provide them with some accountability and how can we structure this in a way where um, where their learning environment is uh, a little bit more than just talking to just one individual in, uh, in a not structured way. And then of course, peer mentoring. Uh, peer mentoring is something that's not leveraged a lot, especially by open source. I mean, we, like I said before, we do it in a very unofficial capacity right now where you don't necessarily call yourself a mentor because you're helping people. Um, but peer mentoring is, is something that should most definitely be used and not only maintainers should be mentoring. So, I mean, even new contributors to our project, uh, I know Gwen, she's in the audience right now. She's actually a great mentor and she just joined the project recently. Uh, and by sharing her or immediate experiences with other people that helps others. Um, and I recently saw this tweet. Uh, this is by uh, Jono Bacon, who is um, one of my favorites in the, uh, in the open source community. He built the Ubuntu community, and George Castro is in the audience too, who uh, used to work with Jono. And I really felt like this tweet created validation for, for some of the stuff that I was doing, especially the peer components. And, it reads, the trick to making communities scale is member-to-member -member mentoring. Categories members and groups and set up clear mentoring links. Have clear criteria for what mentoring completion looks like and of all the support provide mentors. You provide mentors based on mentee feedback. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. So these are the seven programs. Can anybody guess what else is a seven about Kubernetes? The logo? Seven. So anyway, I just figured that out actually why creating this deck. Um, so group mentoring, I'm going to go through in a second. The one-on-one -on -one hour, meet our contributors, outreaching Google Summer of Code, mentoring events, and release team. That's a lot, um, but it addresses all of those use cases. So what's group mentoring? Group mentoring is actually... Uh, I call it my baby um, because it's an idea that is not widely used in open source whatsoever. Lee's in the audience and he just went through our test, which I'll get into in a second. Um, but this is creating sort of a safe environment, if you will, to ask dumb questions. And I say dumb in, in quotes because I, I hear that a lot. It's, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, but this is a peer, leveraging peer mentoring in a semi-structured self-paced learning environment. Um, so a SIG would come to me and say, hey, I need a certain type of, uh, I need a certain type of contributor. In this case, in the case for Lee and the test that we ran, uh, QBDM said, uh, hey, we need more reviewers. Uh, meaning people who are currently members and they would like to get into a, a reviewer file to review PRs. Um, and 
according to the community membership guide, that takes roughly two to three months to get to membership status. So we created a two to three month uh, program where we taught them uh, different skills needed. So for instance, testing infra uh, as it relates to reviewers. Uh, Tim Hawkins did a live, like how to do a code review and what he looks for. Uh, and then we had also uh, many different other kinds of resources available. Uh, everybody gets together in a Slack channel. The Slack channel is private, again, because we're trying to create a safe environment. Uh, and then each one of the uh, the peers would ultimately uh, talk to each other and like throw out questions and they help each other and there's a relationship of four to one um, and four to one meaning four mentees to one mentor um, and the goal is predetermined the goal is get to the next level uh, and the goal is already those requirements are already drawn out in the community membership guide so if it says like you have to have 20 PRs on your belt uh, or something along those lines, then that's what you're going to be doing through the program. And we have these bi-weekly check-ins, and that's holding you accountable. And again, they're four, it's four to one, so this individual, it's almost like a mini team, if you will. Uh, and the individual mentor, uh, with my help and with you know other coordinators' helps, would, would do these bi-weekly stand-ups and ask, hey, how are you doing? Um, and some of them are even on Slack. So sometimes you don't even need to jump on a call. You jump on Slack, you predetermine a time and you say everybody's going to get on slack between this four hour window uh, and hey what's going on with everybody and then people post their issues in the chat and say hey i'm having an issue here um, i really drew this from um, mozilla leadership and ada academy they have uh, cohorts of similar nature but not necessarily quite this so what do we learn from this, uh, from the test anyway? Uh, we learned that it works. Uh, it works because we graduated three, uh, well actually it'll be five here shortly, Lee's graduating uh, hopefully next week. Uh, but we graduated almost half of the people that we went in with and then the other half of course, again, had human responses of got busy, uh, had other things come up. Um, we also learned that over three time zones isn't a thing. So meaning uh, if you are in this period cohort uh, and you span multiple time zones, it's not going to work. We actually had eight time zones represented uh, and it ended up being only a very small population of those peers that were in like the same, like similar time zones would talk to each other. Uh, and ideally what we want everyone in that cohort to talk to each other, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily just uh, the people within that time zone. Um, and again, we, we learned that people have lives and things come up. This is natural, a uh, natural part of mentoring. The one-on-one -on -one hour. This addresses, um, I want to talk to somebody for like a one-on-one -on -one session. So we're predetermining the activity and the goal. Uh, we're saying, tell us what you want. So uh, a code review, how to pair programming and ask me anything session, a code based tour, you get one shot, one hour, one mentee, one mentor, one time. Uh, and it could be with someone that's either a peer that's been on the project longer or even a maintainer, if so they sign up to be a, a mentor. This was actually inspired by the GopherCon Buddy program. Uh, and that is sort of kind of like the, the newcomer's lounge that QCon rolled out this year, where you just get paired up with someone that is a little bit more experienced with you for a short time period. Meet our contributors. This is a, uh, an answer to, I have some quick questions and I'm not finding it in documentation or I need something clarified or I have a one-off question uh, and maybe somebody can help me. This is a once a month live session and it's very similar to user office hours except for the audience is different to contributors. We take questions on Slack and Twitter and some of the questions span from, uh, I have a flaky test, what the heck's going on to how do I become a reviewer, to what's your favorite color, uh, to why open source, uh, why Kubernetes. Uh, it was, it's really spanned the gamut, but it's been really fun and cool. Uh, we've had over, uh, I think, 200 views on one video, and that means to me that we've helped at least 200, potentially 200 people, uh, and that's scalable, uh, and that's kind of what we're going for here. 
Outreachy and Google Summer of Code. Outreachy is a program where uh, they pay underrepresented folks in tech to work in open source. Uh, it's a, a known issue that uh, mostly white males work on open source because they can afford to. Uh, so Outreachy is a very cool program that is a third party that helps us with that. And CNCF and Google paid for two Outreachy interns for us to run a test to see what this would be like for us. Uh, this actually is a little bit more of a time commitment for us. It's probably the most that we have out of all of the uh, out of all of the um, all of the programs that we've put forth. Uh, and then Google Summer of Code is a really cool program that Google does for uh, students, and that's addressing the, you know, getting more students involved. And just by being in the program uh, and during the application process, we're being seen by thousands of students. Uh, so this is at least getting our PR out as well, that we're a project that looks for new contributors, especially students. Now, both of these, though, aren't necessarily going to answer scale, so that's why they're in addition to, and we're not necessarily going forward with them as the only solution. Uh, I actually see a lot of open source projects that say, oh, we have mentoring, and then you find out that it's just Google Summer of Code, and you're like, well, how many interns are you really taking on that's scaling that your, your, uh, scaling your project? Um, so it's definitely something that, that has, that has uh, gone on in planning. Uh, next is mentoring events. This answers, like, I want a one-on-one -on -one session, and I kind of want it now. Uh, KubeCon in Seattle will have a speed networking event, and uh, I'd love to have you all there and participate as mentors. Um, and yesterday, we did a new contributor workshop uh, at the Contributor Summit, led by Gwyn and Josh Berkus. I'm not sure if they're here. A huge round of applause for them. Not really yet, but soon. Um, and. Uh, I'd like to scale this by doing what they did yesterday and creating a self-service way for meetups and things like that to uh, onboard contributors and uh, provide some mentoring and some guidance there. Uh, and they did a really great job with that, and I think that's something that we can definitely scale. Um, Last but not least is the release team. This was something that I definitely can't take credit for. Uh, several members have helped out with this, including Jay Singer DeMars and uh, other release leads and release team members and some of our veterans. This is a, a really cool way to look at succession planning. And uh, what they do is they have the team and then the team has different uh, shadow roles. So for instance, the release, uh, the release team lead excuse me, has a shadow. Uh, and then ultimately, that is just creating a natural mentoring environment where the shadow has to come onto uh, the calls, and then they're maybe even responsible for a few different small minor tasks, um, but they're really getting a lay of the land of how the release team works. Uh, we actually have people, especially new contributors, float through the release team. And uh, one of our new contributors, Noah, actually wrote a really great perspective uh, uh, on his blog about his experience as a new contributor going through the release team as a shadow. Uh, definitely check that out when I upload my slides because yes, I have not uploaded my slides yet. Um, <laughs> and uh, But so check that out. Um, I put this in here because this, my flowchart is huge. Uh, and the, the f I really wanted to put this in here and not exclude it because I'm really working off of one single source of truth here. And this is where the automation comes in because we're cr essentially creating databases that um, will create alert systems and calendar systems and all different really kinds of cool ways of scaling this. And this, like I said, this is just a snip. Um, but I wanted to put this up here too because I wanted to sort of say help wanted and please help us in some of these automation areas. Uh, we definitely could need it, and that's another reason why uh, we should be scaling a little bit faster, because I just need a little bit more help with the automation pieces. And the last is, where did I get some of this stuff from? Like, how did I brew up some of these ideas? Uh, and I really created a lot of these ideas from programs that are already existing and sort of took a lot of their success stories and melded them into uh, the programs that you see, that you just saw here today. Um, again, Mozilla, uh, OpenStack has an awesome upstream institute, uh, Google Summer of Code, Exorcism IO is where I saw a, a kind of a group peer, uh, a group pair programming thing that's 
really cool. Uh, and that's sort of where the one-on-one -on -one hour kind of was sort of formed. And, and again, same with the, the GopherCon and things like that. Um, thanks to everybody that has provided uh, yourself as a test dummy, especially Lee uh, over here, who is now graduating into an owner's file, um, but providing that feedback that we need of how we can, how we can make this better. Um, how can you get involved? Uh, all, again, all of, all of these slides will be uploaded, but we have, we have some um, documentation now uh, under the community repo in the mentoring folder. We have mentoring guidelines, mentee guidelines, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're a SIG and you need other uh, contributors of any variety, please reach out to me. Uh, and if you'd love to uh, help me build this stuff, like I said, some of the stuff is still in a, uh, a state that is not implementable yet, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, you can catch me in any of the, consp uh, the, contr uh, the excuse me, the contributor experience channels uh, or uh, Paris uh, is my display name and I'll just go ahead and put that up now. I don't think I have time for questions. I think I'm over actually. Sorry. See you in the hall. <laughs>